Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and with me, as always, is a man who every day commits to memory 50 new facts and remembers every one of them. I'm the Adam Glass. One of the facts that I've committed to memory actually affects our next movie, so remind me of that. Oh, This week, though. This week, though. I do not commit to memory 50 new facts a day, so I'm probably going to forget before the next episode. (laughs) It's all right. It's all right. I'll commit enough today that I'll forget before the next episode. Anyway, this week we're talking about Alfred Hitchcock's The 39 Steps. Made in 1935, this is our second Hitchcock? I believe. Uh, Yeah, it's only our second one. After after The Lady Vanishes, which he made in 1938, three years later. um, The Lady Vanishes was the last movie he made in Britain, which means, chronologically, this was made in Britain. Very good. And for our next <laughs> our next mathematical word problem. The thing is, is there, did you, I know we should probably talk more about the movie before we just start getting into it, but, um. (laughs) Okay. No, you go ahead. There's a noticeable quality difference between this and The Lady Vanishes over the course of two years or something like that, three years. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Like, is it, do you think it's transfer? (laughs) Like, is this just the best cut that they had laying around anymore? Well. Did it always um, look like this, this bad? Where did you, where did you watch I watched it on Hulu. Hulu. The thing about this, and in fact about the next movie we'll be watching with Charade, um, are uh, that they're both in the public domain. Oh. So the versions on Hulu are not the Criterion releases. Really? Yeah. They are in their normal area, not in the Criterion area on Hulu. So they are the, the public domain releases. Now there's no there's no editing differences, mind you. There's nothing. It's not like Criterion right, found but, a lost scene. But then again, Criterion so you, you has a tendency to go hunt for a better transfer. I think. Yeah. Then. But they always they always try the best transfer, and they digitally uh, enhance that transfer for for their releases. So yeah, there was a lot of problem in uh, in film quality with this. Um, did you watch the DVD or did you watch the? Hulu? I watched it. I watched it on Hulu okay. as well. As well. Um, Though I did watch Charade on Netflix well, here's the thing: Hulu. Charade on Hulu looked fine. Charade on Hulu though was in full uh, was in uh, full screen instead of widescreen. Yeah, but I've screen. gotten so used to the old movies that we watch being in full screen anyway that I don't yeah. notice or care. And besides, I was watching I, like it, I was watching on like my the, on my Nexus Seven. So while my son was watching <laughs> Toy Story or something, so I don't really well, notice that much. Yeah. Well, it's 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 not a huge deal in charade, um, cinema <laughs> cinematography wise. This is certainly the better movie of the two, um, which is why we'll focus on talking about it since it's this episode. Yes, I yeah. Let's not talk about charade anymore. <laughs> yes. So this is based on a 1950 novel by John Buckham Buckin, eh, um, whatever. Who incidentally was the first Buchanan. Baron of Tweeds. <laughs> no, it's Buchan. There's no. There's only. It's B U C H A N. Okay, I believe you. Okay. Anyway, he was the first Baron of Tweed Smear, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> Wait, what? This is the first Baron of Tweed Smear? T W E E D S M U I R. I don't know how one becomes a first Baron in Tweed Smear. Nineteen hundred. Yeah. What? Tweed Smear. I don't. I don't know. Uh, he we was must do a Scottish lot of novelist later. Scottish novelist, but he was raised in South Africa. Um, Donat, our... Uh, I'm sorry, Donat's the actor who plays Hene, the main character. Hene, uh, in the original novel, is Scottish. Um, it's actually, it's, he's very much an insert for Buckin, um, from what I've read, though. I've not read the, uh, the stories. Um, so he's not Canadian <laughs> in in the novel, which is only one minor change. Um, but there's a lot of changes. This is one of the first adaptations from a novel or short story uh, to really dramatically 
change what was going on. And from what I've read, that was a little bit of an issue when it came up because the Brits, especially at the time, like books a lot more than they like movies. Mm, um, mm, I can so. Yeah. They didn't. As far as adaptations go, this is a pretty good one in final product. But but if it's he does this, do a lot of if changes. it's that untrue to the story, they're not going to care. Yeah. Hmm. So some some changes. First off, that main character is Canadian. Um, yeah, but that's cosmetic, know. right? The place of person. Yeah, that's from that's it. cosmetic. Yeah, and and that's done. That's done. I think politically for release of the movie, um, it's it's something. I feel like Hitchcock did it in a couple other movies, but you make you make a character Canadian so that they're still British as far as that goes, but they're also have an American accent. Right, so. you can use American actors and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this was a British actor actually, but uh, I think he was British. <clears throat> well, anyway, we'll never know doesn't about matter where donut. he's from. It doesn't matter where he's from because he has a an okay accent that Americans can relate to. So this movie gets to be released in America with not a problem. Uh, the female lead, um, in as much as she's a lead, again, uh, Pamela, the woman he meets on the train, uh, who ends up very important to the second half of the movie. Um, also, while the British actress had been in a couple of American movies already and had a bit of uh, name recognition there. So this is a movie designed to get... American audiences? American audiences. Um, and, you know, three years later... He made The Lady Vanishes, and that was the last movie he made in Britain until the 60s or 70s, I think. Mm. So, so, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, let's see. Other changes. <laughs> the entire... No, no, this is important. Okay. Um, the 39 Steps in, in the movie, I think, is a vast improvement to the 39 Steps in the book. The 39 Steps in the movie refers to the spy agency, or the spy whatever, the bad guys. Right. Um, whereas in the book, it was literally 39 steps down to the beach where the escape boat was. Huh? Uh, no, I mean, the, I understand uh, that concept, but, like, w- would it matter? It doesn't. Like, I it could be called someone, the 40 steps or the 110 steps. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Like somebody's Apparently, gonna... when when Buckin was writing it, um, his daughter had just learned to count and she was very excited to announce that there were 39 steps from wherever he was writing it down to wherever she had been. <laughs> so that's the backstory on that. So that's the backstory on that. suffering from the, like, the, the, all that recalls the memory is, like, a stupid family guy bit I saw a long time ago about Stephen King. And, like, him <laughs> proposing his next book and he looks at a lamp and he goes, it's an <coughs> evil lamp. Yes. It kills people. Yes. It's like, okay. <clears throat> the uh, the novel, Hene, is... He's, he's as much um, the, the no-man who's just thrust into things, which I think is probably why Hitchcock was drawn to him. It's a character type he very much likes and he uses in a lot of his movies. Um, uh... But he uh, in the in the movie, I think he, I really feel like Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart could have played this character pretty well. Obviously, not at the time, not in thirty five. Um, they were a bit too young. Well, but, yeah. Uh, like the thing is, is that he's supposed to be an everyman who's thrown into the situation. But like a lot of movies made today, he's the worst, the least everyman, everyman ever. Well, yeah, he does but, things but at the that same are time, crazy. Well, go. You go ahead. But at the same time, he's not hes not your average movie hard-boiled protagonist from 1935. That's he's, true. There's no fedora. He's softer. He's wittier. He's, uh... Yeah. He's, he's more Cary Grant than... I don't know. Insert character we can't think of. <laughs> um, well, he's more the thin man than Sam Spade, but he's also not drunk like, the, <laughs> like Nick is all the time. So, um... <laughs> It's yeah. I mean, he's an easier character. Yeah, he. I, and I understand, it, but then like he does things like give a super rousing speech and things that like he is every man, but he's also <laughs> intensely charismatic. Well, which makes yeah. him not and, really an every man. In that, like a normal yeah. man thrust onto a stage, probably isn't going to give rousing rhetoric, even though he's in a his, predicament his, where like 
he he is describing his own situation up there, but yeah, that doesn't change the fact that he does it in such a way that is very charismatic. His sense of improv is is a bit more than the well, average. He demonstrates a, a really profound sense of improv in like his escapes too. I mean, like he does yeah, things that yeah. like I wouldn't be able He's to super come good up at with. thinking on his feet. Yes, apparently. Well, yeah, no, of course he has to be. He's the hero. That's... I know, but then he's not an everyman anymore. He's the hero. <laughs> okay. okay. That's my problem with that, that the Fun. everyman notion in general, okay? I'm not saying this, this yeah, specific no. to this movie, but it's good to see that it goes back all the way to 1935. Oh, that sure the everyman is that. some sort of near god like man. <laughs> he's he's just every man enough that we can relate right <laughs> but not every man enough to get shot in the first well he does get shot but and that's fine i do shot. like the fact that he gets shot i really there are certain yeah, yeah. elements where you're like man this guy is not you know that good at this yes. <laughs> not, not that good at this <laughs> yeah i like being the hero um Actually, actually, on him getting shot, one of my favorite sequences uh, until the very the very last thing we see about them is the uh, the Scottish uh, the Scottish farmer and his wife uh, who who take our main character in, uh, and then the wife helps him. The, the farmer not so much, but the farmer is uh, so ridiculously antagonistically religious. <laughs> I really love like he prays he he prays that God bless our. Uh, terrible souls or whatever right. and, and uh, she says uh, when she when she offers uh, Hene the raincoat uh, as a disguise he he's worried that the guy will be angry enough to hit her uh, and he says no he'll pr- <laughs> he'll pray at me but nothing more of course he does end up hitting her because his his hymn book was in the was in the coat and it's that that prompts a slap, an right. off-screen slap. Uh, the fact that he's lost his hymn book. <laughs> because the Scots, they're violent, but only sometimes. Only about hymn yes. books. It's only, about, only about hymn books. Specifically, nothing um, else. Not even other... But it is that hymn book that saves our main character's life. And it's it's ridiculously done. It's like... I said... I, I hate to keep coming back to other Hitchcock things this reminds me of, but at the same time, you know, it kind of has to. Um, that scene, it's kind of glossed over, much like how does Jimmy Stewart get down from the roof in the opening scene of Vertigo? Right, right. He's hanging from the roof, and then, boom, he's in his apartment. Um, he gets shot, and then we cut to the couple discussing where the hymn book is. Then we cut to him at the sheriff's office. Yeah, uh, it's really weird. Talking about how, how the he hymn escaped book saved him. Like the, yeah. we are not we are clearly not following the <laughs> the adage of show don't tell. <laughs> yes. Because he, so he tells, tells us, us the that entire they, yeah. They put his body somewhere. I I guess yeah, that would have been boring to see. I don't know 20 that it minutes. would have. Because it doesn't need to take 20 minutes. Dra- <laughs> like they show him being shot. They cut to the hymn book being discussed. They cut to them dragging him into a room. Then they cut to like him climbing out a window. We're yeah. talking about three minutes yeah. worth of cuts. Well, really, seriously, it's, you're the right. You're right, but it does time. it does serve to get him to a position where he's telling the sheriff about what's happened up to this point, and um, the sheriff he needs to have that meeting with the sheriff in order for the right. sheriff to Understood. reveal that, yes. that he's. Not necessarily a good guy. Not necessarily a bad guy. There, there's, the sheriff there's some, is not. The sheriff. There's is, a lot we could discuss on on motives. Oh, we're going in this to. Because movie. I have issues. There's there's especially I think in the ending there's issues with motive. Um, Yo, I but, don't uh, understand the ending. I feel like a buffoon. <laughs> like, well, but before we get into that, okay. So first of all, let's, get, <clears throat> let's just nail the sheriff down right now, okay? Because okay. I have a problem okay. in general. Nobody believes him. Yeah. Okay. Now, mind you, we're not quite on the... We're not dealing with an eve of war situation quite yet, okay? Yeah. But, nonetheless, like, everyone dismisses him in a very severe way. Like, Well, we hit this... I imagine that if you wander around today, or any time in history, claiming that, like, 
spies are after you, and so, yeah, maybe they're going to treat you like you're a little bit crazy, but they're going to try to corroborate your story. Yeah. They're going to try and see if maybe you're telling the truth. But, like, they but don't we seem get that to put same any effort into that. It's something, it's something I think Hitch, uh, it had to have been reality at the time because it's something Hitchcock uses again in Lady Vanishes. It seems like he's attacking the, the British public in, in how he characterizes how, uh, how they don't really believe in the evils of the world. No, I right, guess. and it's weird though because, yeah, maybe it is attacking the British Repo- uh, public, but then I have to ask my question is like, were American audiences at the time satisfied with that? Because I, I wouldn't have been... I mean, like, again, there's no way for me to use a 1935 mindset, okay? It's impossible. But, yeah, like, there had to have been people who walked out going, like, why did anybody listen to him? Well, I think like, there, nobody listens there to probably him at were. But given the popularity of this movie, even at the time, uh, this is one of the first movies that was both critically acclaimed and popularly acclaimed. Um, I'd have to say that not enough people... We're thinking about that, yeah, well. and that's you know this is this is a string of plot holes uh, bolted together, and <laughs> yes, uh, it is. <laughs> you know it's it's bolted together fast enough that watching it you don't mind, Man. and that's a lot of Hitchcock work. That's a lot mm, of Hitchcock I'm work. Um, but I'm a special sort of anal retentive about plot holes, as you know. On a on a quick aside, I I always want the past tense of mind to be mound instead of minded, and. But that would in, that would make very awkward sentences, Adam. I know, but I still want it to be true. If we find something and then we found it, yeah. why can't we mine something and have mounded it? Have mounded. But but I. Uh, <laughs> but sorry, Adam, let's, let's, get, get, off. let's like, well, get off my you, terrible. You, when you brine pickles, you don't you don't brown them. <laughs> it's almost the same sound. It's not quite the same, but. All right, you make a good point. You don't sign I'll and then begrudgingly sound. admit that one. Yeah, but that's a—I mean, that's a totally different mm, etymology. Well, I know, but yeah. but the point is that <laughs> these days most of our doesn't operate on etymology anymore. It oper- operates on uh, what sound, seems right? At the yeah, time. sound, and like we don't. Nobody wants to say mound, except for you, Adam. Uh, I want to say. Let's mound. not have this conversation anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, police officer. Doesn't believe anybody. Yeah, um, yeah and, and on, at the same time, I think his his justification for not believing him in that he has become quick friends with this other guy, and this other guy's eh, the the professor, whatever the bad guy is, clearly charismatic. Um, yeah, but would you trust a man who's missing yes. a finger? <laughs> I would. Well, I want it, but I'm racist against deformities, yeah. so maybe I am too. You know. Well, you know, the funny thing about it is, very, is that we're, we're classical. The, the funny us. thing is, is the place where I live now, I certainly yeah. wouldn't trust a man who's missing a finger. <laughs> I'm well, not going to explain I think you any live, further, okay? Because I don't want to get killed. I think, I think in a way, you still live in uh, where you live now is still a culture that accepts the deformities are an evil. Well, but the uh, the reason why you would have that deformity is pretty well known among the general population here. Well, yes, okay. yes. If missing a thing, if missing a finger, specifically yes. missing okay. a finger, you're not you're going to give that person some very serious <laughs> second looks. Yes. Um. Yes. So, but okay. So let's. But I want to go back to something. Okay. Okay. First of all. What what number of seconds did it take you to figure out that the man with the memory was the plot device? Was like the answer. I think it took me about eight. <laughs> At the beginning? Yeah. Within the like, first five um, minutes of the movie. Because they introduce him, and again, we get into the classic, like, if there's a gun on the wall... I it's guess... Gonna be, it's gonna I go guess. off by... Well, I forget the quote, but you know what I mean. Yeah, like yeah. I looked if at him and I thought, this is a Hitchcock movie, yeah. and this guy has addictive er, memory, or at least close enough to not be. Not let's yeah. not argue because that doesn't exist, right? But the point is that he has an incredible memory. I'm like, okay, well we've got our uh, we've got our Falcon, uh, <laughs> and now it's just a matter of time before we find out that he has the information. 
Now, mind you, I guess maybe audiences in 1935 were not quite as aware, especially American audiences were probably not quite as aware that Hitchcock was going to do that to them. Yeah. But as as somebody who does know what Hitchcock is going to do to me, I was like, man, this guy, yeah. huh? No, I, I, I can't say that there was any moment where I thought, oh, duh, the memory guy. Um, or, or even, but here's even the at the beginning. Thing I wasn't surprised when we got to the end no, that that's how the like, plot was resolved. Here's the thing. I remember thinking, oh, the memory guy. But then I was totally dissatisfied with how we ended up at the memory guy. Because, like, yeah. the story doesn't really explain why it's the memory guy. Yeah. They just, like, you well, don't understand why he's doing We don't understand the memory guy at all. They offhandedly try to justify it in saying that the uh, the um, there were no papers missing when okay, Pamela that's goes true. Right. to the when Pamela goes to the police. Um, they say, "Oh, we've called everyone, and there's nothing. There's no significant papers missing that anyone would want to steal. So we don't believe you." Um, which is actually another change from the novel. The memory guy doesn't exist in the novel. It's just paper. the whole. Oh, yeah. There's a really offhand reference to him going to a music hall and being bored. Um, but other than that, so he left early, I think is what it says. And he goes back to his apartment, and then a male spy breaks into his apartment and, and gets the plot rolling. Uh, instead of instead of the woman, who is the only person with a foreign accent in the entire, in the entire movie. The, the spy at the beginning. Right. Who, uh, well, that's how we have to know that that's how we go home with him. Yes, that's how she's born. Um, but uh, but yeah, they do try to justify it. I had it. forgotten about the papers thing. I that had never clicked in yeah. my head. But like, um, the thing well, about like, it is, again, I kind like of like the memory guy as a plot device better than the other way it could be. I mean, yeah, which would just be investigation. Yeah, I guess. I like, if it makes for, I mean, it's good if you do not know what Alfred Hitchcock is going to do. It's great. But as soon as so you know what mentioned, he's going to do, it's not so great. Real quick, though, your mention of, of the Falcon uh, reminds me of something I, I read recently. Uh, a letter from Hitchcock to Truffaut explaining MacGuffins uh, sets it up as a joke of two guys on a train. Much like the, uh, the two guys, uh, two guys, uh, Hannah ends up sitting across from. Yeah, the, the brawl salesman. Actually, yeah, but two guys, uh, two guys, one says, eh, one's got a big box, and, and the other asks, oh, what's, it, what's in your box? And the guy says, oh, it's a MacGuffin. Oh, what's a MacGuffin? Oh, it's a, it's an apparatus for catching lions on, on the moors. The guy says, well, there, there are no lions on the moors. And the other guy opens the box and says, and there's no MacGuffin. <laughs> Fascinating. That's pretty, know, that's pretty it's good. A, it's a great little joke, but yeah. Anyway, so my my problem with the memory guy isn't that I saw it coming necessarily. Even if I saw it coming, that sort of thing doesn't bother me about a movie. Um, I'm it, does when the, it, it bothers me when a movie's supposed to be a like suspense. Yeah, but it's also from 1935, so no. I expect that I suspect that even suspenseful things from 1935, I will have already somewhere in my memory banks learned that. Oh, this is what goes. This is what happens in this movie. But that's the thing is, I had never heard of this movie, so I didn't. Yeah. There was no, like, oh, it's the memory guy. I somebody told me that or something like that. Like, it's this was like this is the most obvious answer to, like, yeah, what's going to happen. Well, my problem with the memory because guy it was the guy whistling that... in freaking the lady vanishes. Okay, like yes. for me, like at this point, I now understand how like. <laughs> Thanks to that movie in particular, especially, more than any of his other movies, I now completely yeah. understand how every Alfred Hitchcock, uh, th- like, uh, suspense works. Foreshadowing and... Yeah, and, because, and like, if you're looking everything. for foreshadowing, it's yes. very obvious when he's doing it. Yes. But, like, you're not supposed no, you're to be. Right I mean, I know you're not supposed to be, you're but right unfortunately, I'm a very, very terrible movie watcher. <laughs> I'm not good That's at watching right. movies without like ruining them for myself. So my my problem again, as I've tried to say four times Sorry. now, with him, it's fine, it's fine. No, you're good. 
Uh, is that at the beginning he doesn't seem like he's in some sort of trance when he's doing the memory recollection thing. I mean, he's making jokes about, he says, oh, you must be Canadian, when, when our main character asks him how far it is from Montreal to Toronto or whatever the question is. Um, but at the end, uh, why is he compelled to answer what are the 39 steps? I know, I don't under, maybe he, maybe, I and don't he, know. <laughs> he does look at that point like he might be in some sort of trance. I suppose you could justify it in saying he doesn't want to say I don't know to anything that he does actually know, a matter of pride in his ability. But yeah, he has to know it would be better for him not to answer that question. Like, are we supposed to believe it's like a, like, he can't... I'm going to try to explain this in a way that's going to take some time and it's probably not going to be very clear. You okay. know how when you get on a roll and you're kind of accessing memory more yeah. quickly than you yeah. would be able to if you actually, like, like going through just, cognition? He's so, he's so into it at that point that, that Yeah, just I think that maybe that's what we're supposed to believe. Snap, he just snap, snap. answers yeah. the question. He doesn't even think about what the question is. The information is just there. And, like, maybe yeah. he... But, like, it doesn't actually come off as that way in the movie. No, it doesn't. But I was... Because in the first one, the first show with him, it's a little bit more like that. I went back and watched. There's a certain, like, he just answers. Yeah. Like, there's no hesitation. There's no pause. There's no, like, the, he when he's answering questions, he doesn't, um, he doesn't, uh, he does say, oh, you must be from Canada that one time. But otherwise, yeah. he just answers questions. And he does make okay. jokes. But, like, I don't know, like... Uh, yeah, I think we're supposed to think he's like in the zone. <laughs> yeah, and even on t- even on top of that, uh, there is no reason for the people who are arresting Hene to uh, be listening to what the guy on stage is saying. No, say. there's not. Um, so when he shouts, "What are the thirty nine steps?" and the guy actually responds about the criminal conspiracy, I think it's uh, actually more that there's enough of an audience. Right, I mean, like, we're supposed to be, like, he's... Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I know. Like, because yeah. they're not listening, well, in they're the not going to know the that audience, he's not. The audience, yeah, the audience is already reacting to the scuffle, so there's there's more background noise, too. Um, certainly, certainly the shooting of the guy on stage causes a bit of a uh, stop in what's going on, as far as the police are concerned. But, uh... I don't know. And maybe they're not paying attention until he gets shot. And Then they know, just then we get that back. Why? Why was yeah, this then we get that back scene, and then we get that back scene, and Hene is, is interrogating him, asking what the information was, blah, blah, blah. Which, by and the way, sharing. okay. Yeah. Keep, keep going. I'm gonna, I need to talk about the information in a minute. No, talk about the information. I was about to segue into it. Okay. Um, it's the information for how to make a silent airplane. Yes. Adam, what a weird, weird thing. Like, I, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting, like, it's kind of obvious that at this point, Alfred Hitchcock is worried about Britain's future. Yes. In the face of, like, Europe, what's going on. But, like, this is really early. 1935 yeah. is early. Yeah. And he had to start making this movie before 1935. Right? Like, I mean, he didn't crank this yeah. thing out in an afternoon. So we're talking, he he pretty early, it's pretty obvious what he's concerned about. And I think that's kind of amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. In its own little way. Like, it's a pretty early to, like... Well, we've seen, we've seen a lot of movies made in the mid-30s that look forward to, you know, to, to the coming storm, so to speak. Yeah, but I, um, I feel like this is really so Lady early. Vanishes does yeah, it but, in 38. But that's, and that's but pretty, everybody, at 38, 38 everybody knows what's going on. <laughs> like, but, uh, there's some denial, know, but there's not, nobody's like saying, like, mm, I don't know. The first movie we watched, the, uh... Like when was that made? I don't the name of it now. Yeah, I know. That was made in thirty six. Okay, so not much later after this. Yeah, so that's that's pretty, mm-hmm. and then that's obviously that's obviously anti war, anti war in a way that 
really wants to sell, hey guys, we're going down this road again, we need to not go down this road. Right. Um, so, you know, and that's that's only a, a year later. So, maybe, maybe not. I <laughs> Not not living in nineteen mid nineteen thirties Britain. Yeah, we don't know, I, but I, don't know. I mean, mid nineteen thirties Europe. Of course, there's also the argument that that uh, that first movie we watched was French, and the French are a lot closer to this than the than the British. The uh, the Channel does a lot to separate them from continental politics. Okay, well, you know what? I'm looking, and I guess at that point there had already been some some. Let's see here. Well, let's see. In thirty in thirty five, Hitler's not in power yet, is he? A pa- he no, he he, he, is, he is not in power, but um, but no, he's no, still no, he's wait. still he's on the rise. At the at his first meeting with all the leading generals and admirals of the Reich on February third, nineteen thirty three, Hitler spoke okay, of conquest so. of Lebensraum in the east and its ruthless Germanization. Yeah. So well, even even before he was, you know, in power, he was still on his way. To right, power. right, yeah. It, I mean, I guess if you are if you're interested in, uh, if you're the kind of person who really is worried about international politics at this time, you're going to be able to maybe read those tea leaves pretty clearly. Yeah, it's it's clear that this guy's uh, this guy's something to talk yeah. about. But you know, Hitchcock does it in a, in a weird way, in that no one is ever. Uh, no one has a nationality. No one has a nationality. Yeah, I love it though. Like, even even the, the lady vanishes of... in thirty eight. Yeah. Even in thirty eight, in the lady vanishes, it takes place in some made up European country, and the enemy is not necessarily German, uh, even though they're very clearly Germanic. Um, but in this one, it's even more rude. In fact, the uh, the bad guys in the original novel are given away uh, because of their German accents, I believe, hmm. from what I read. So, uh, but it takes place again. It was written in 1915, so it takes place pre World War One, on the cusp of World War One, when Germans were also a an entity not to be trusted, right? Um, as they as are far today, as the Brits were concerned. Well, of, of course, always. <laughs> Let's be, let's take it's a moment I to once, be racist. I, um, I, no, I once saw a newsreel, uh, and I, I can't remember. I think John Wayne was new, narrating it, but it was made in, like, the early 50s, if not late 50s, you know, sometime sometime in that decade, uh, talking about the history of the last 50 years of the German people and, and how we need to keep a close eye on them because every so often they get uppity and do something crazy. <laughs> I wish I could remember what that was, but it was completely ridiculous. I love it. Oh, I love. I love racism. Uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's that'll be the, that'll be our quote for this week. I love racism. Pat loves racism. No, I just I love especially old timey racism is just hilarious. No, well, yeah, like no, that, that like that that, that, actually... that the, the innate nature of a people thing is just funny to me. Yeah, that segues into into related to racism, sexism. Oh and, my uh, god, a yes. A principal complaint of Hitchcock films that is completely justifiable is how he treats women. Oh yeah, it's horrible. Um, in that even even his female heroes um, just want to get married in the end. Yeah. Uh, and then are... are but, and just are just treated like crap. Yeah. So in this one we have two two females that are added to the plot from the novel. We We... The the spy is a woman, and she's she's strong enough as her own character, and her and she is a spy, so that's she's got that going for her. Um, and she implies that she wants to have sex outside of marriage, uh, so that's that's interesting for for her characterization. Given you know, given in other Hitchcock movies, how important it is, you know, this this isn't like was it, uh, these aren't James Bond characters, James Bond. You know, doesn't even learn a first name before he bets a woman. Um, these are in any Hitchcock movie where sex happens, uh, that isn't rape. Um, marriage happens first. Uh, marriage is shorthand for sex. Um, love leads to marriage, not to sex. In well, Hitchcock movies, yeah, but this is also these are a vastly different era than the the, the yeah. 
film James oh, yeah, Bond certainly. era. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, but uh, you know, in this, we've got that female character, and she's strong, but she dies. Yeah, and also she dies in a really her. ridiculous way. And a really, someone sneaks into her room and stabs her in the back. Right, like how does that asleep. happen? Yeah, like could that happen to yeah. you, Adam? That couldn't happen to me. Well, I sleep on my back. That's exactly I'm a my point. Light sleeper, so probably not. But and uh, considering some ridiculous percent of the population either sleeps on their side or on their back, <laughs> yeah, uh, it'd be pretty. It'd hard. be very hard. And then the knife sticks out. Like it looks like it's only like an eighth of an inch inside of her back. Yes. At worst, yes. we might have chipped a bone. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's like I, when but, I saw that, I was like, oh man. Like, because we're talking I had about a, a time, like, stage knives, like, making a knife look like it's really in somebody's back is not that hard. No. This is not an effect not. that, like, man, they just didn't have the technology in 1935. No. You cut more off the knife. That's, <laughs> exactly, that's, that's what, what, what I'm saying. Do. This is the least complicated effect in history. Yes. So, I don't know. I had hope for Paola when we first introduced her. I really did. Uh, in that she... Our, our hero, in attempting to throw off the people chasing him, does that classic kiss a random woman thing. Uh, and uh, she immediately calls the police. I love it, though. That's great. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's, it's a shame I hate it reminded me, the film. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, a scene from the third season of Community where Starburns is being, uh, being chased by the main characters in a Law & Order send-up. And he grabs a he grabs a girl and says, "Kiss me. I'll explain later." And she she hesitates. He says, "Kiss me. I'll explain later." Um, and uh, she says, "The explanation isn't the issue." <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets caught. Um, but uh, but yeah, she's she shows an independence. She's traveling alone, I guess, which isn't. Uh, I mean, even in The Lady Vanishes, our main character, when she's showing independence, is traveling with friends. Um, but then her independence vanishes. Yeah. You know, really, yeah. like, then, later on in the middle of the film, I'm not sure, like, yeah. do the, hand, the handcuffs have to be <sighs> metaphorical in some way, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> well, as we get, why is she even with the police at that point? You know, there's no reason for her to... Well, well she's with the fake police. Well, she's with the fake police, and she's with the fake police, and their justification is that uh, she needs to identify him. But there's there's no reason that she needs to identify them. There is no reason for her to be with the fake police unless she is in on the conspiracy, but she's not in on the conspiracy. Yeah, that's true, because like all she would be identifying him is as the man who unjustly on the run kissed earlier. her. Yeah. Well, well but that's she, the thing is, like, knows... they already know who's on the run. Yeah, like exactly. all they would be they need know. her for is like, is that the man who kissed you? Yes. Okay. Well, their we'll, boss we'll, has met him. We'll, we'll, they should know what he looks we'll like. We'll do it. We, I, that's what I'm saying. Is like, um, we'll add that extra six months in jail for molestation of a woman to his sentence. <laughs> yes. Like you know what I mean? Yes. Like there's no. Yeah. There's no. Well, the weird thing is, is they have no reason to need her either. Exactly. That's, that's what, what, I'm no, what I'm saying. Is that like, okay, it would be illogical for the police to have her. But it's even more illogical for them to have her. She serves yeah. no purpose for them. For the police, you could almost say, like, well, we need a witness that saw him getting away, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, it'd be stupid, but you could almost see it. But, like, the bad guys literally do not need her. Yeah. Like, they have no reason to have her. Other than the fact that maybe, like, they've got some, like... Just kidnapping, kidnapping women thing going on on the side. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're already maybe. bad guys, so maybe they just steal women too. I don't know. Yes, stupid bad guys. Yeah. Well, and then like, and all to get them handcuffed together. Which, by the way, she's terrible at this, and that's where it really falls apart. Like, in certain ways, it falls apart for me. Is like, at first, he's like holding his hand over her mouth and stuff. But then, like, they're just escaping. Yeah, yeah. He's running away, and she's not screaming yeah, until like, he stops Why? moving. Is she not doing anything? Yeah. Yeah, she's bad at trying to escape. And then when she sneaks away at the hotel and hears, hears the phone call, um, apparently her trusting him that he's not lying to her is the same as her falling in love with him. Um, 
which again happens a I lot think in is a commentary is a pretty obvious commentary on Hitchcock's view of women. Um, yeah. Did you ever see the Hitchcock, the recent movie that came out about him this year? No, no, it's I did not. It's really um, interesting. It's pretty good, but it paints an incredibly negative picture of the man <laughs> and his relationship <laughs> with women. Because it's almost entirely that about his relationship me. with women. Yeah. And it's really fascinating. He's really bad at it. Yeah. I have had, I have had people um, ask me... Are you Hitchcock? No. Okay. No, just checking. But I've had people ask me for for Hitchcock recommendations because they have talked to people um, who refuse to watch any Hitchcock because of his treatment of women. And on the one hand, you know, I understand not wanting to be involved with that sort of thing, especially especially from a woman's perspective. But I also, <clears throat> what I said to the last guy who asked me was was writing off all of Hitchcock because he's because of his sexism, uh, would be writing off uh, or writing off. Uh, no, no, it was an individual movie. Writing off, she didn't like the person. The other person he had talked to didn't like um, Rear Window. Okay, the writing off Rear Window because of Hitchcock's sexism means you'd have to write off all of Hitchcock for Hitchcock's sexism. That's just how he is. But at um, the same time, that's a, in my opinion, that's a totally justifiable stance. In that, yeah, if you're the kind of person who is stance. bothered by sexism in a film, you can't watch one you of his films without Hitchcock. being. No. You will never enjoy it. It's like no, you won't. it's yeah, you won't. It's impossible. So you don't even bother. Don't waste your time. Yeah. And I almost feel bad in that I can justify it just by, oh, it's a 1935 movie. I can't. Movie. It bothers um, the hell out of me. Oh, it does bother the hell out of me. I can still enjoy the movie. Yeah, I mean, I can say. too. But because I, I, can couldn't, justify, I, couldn't. I can justify it enough to enjoy the movie, but I can't justify it enough to say, oh, this is good how he's portraying right, women. Right, of course. It's, yeah. it's certainly not good how he's portraying women in any of his movies. And the only the only movie, really, that uh, that he does an okay job with is The Lady Vanishes. And That's what he saying. doesn't do an okay job with his female protagonist. Yeah. He does an okay job with the old woman. Um <laughs> Well, then the female protagonist still justifies her existence by getting married at the end. Yeah, that's I. She's the lady for. vanishes. Didn't bother me nearly as much as this one did. As yeah. far as that, yeah. Because this, the, our lead character in here was just sad, or our, yeah. our lead female character was just kind yeah. of sad. And we, uh, she doesn't even have a last name. She's just Pamela. She's just waiting to add a name. <laughs> right, to right. Her she's name. a blank slate in which to add a last name. Yeah, um, and she, we don't even get a whole lot, we know nothing about her, the entire movie. No, she no, was, we don't know she, anything. She was traveling alone, uh, then she gets kidnapped by the main character, she learns to trust him in some sort of Stockholm Syndrome thing. Yeah, right, right, uh, she probably needs to see a counselor and then they won't want to be married anymore. Uh, and I mean, at least, at least we don't see wedding bells and doves at the very end of the movie, uh... Only because I'm, but we do see, yeah. but we do see them holding hands as Mister Memory is dying. You know, which it's, it's is, signified yeah. that that they are in love now. Yeah, and it's a really weird, like yeah, it's a really weird like that part of the story is really upsetting. Really, like in general, like we have this woman who's kidnapped, and she falls in love with her kidnapper. While on the run from people who are trying to kill her kidnapper. Yeah. And, like, yeah, we're supposed to just say, like, mm, okay, yeah, women are dumb and get married, and no. that's how they become real women, or something like that. Yeah. Silly, yes. I don't know. Yeah, oh well. But unfortunately, this is not nearly, in my opinion, as good of a movie as The Lady Vanishes, so. Yeah, I think The Lady Vanishes is better. And movie so, too. for me, this like, is... this movie is less justified in its sexism because it's not as good. <laughs> yeah. This is this is sold this is sold as you know Hitchcock's best thriller or at least his earliest good thriller. And I guess it is his earliest good thriller. I can justify that. I can I can agree with that. Um, you know, his his later thrillers North by Northwest is a better thriller than this. And North by Northwest has a lot of, a lot in common with this movie. Um, you know, a man accidentally getting involved with espionage, blah blah blah, right. you know, mistaken identity, whatever. Um 
North by Northwest doesn't also doesn't treat its women very well. But but again, it's Hitchcock. None of them do. Um, but yeah, it's just it's very bothersome the way it is. So let's let's try and segue from the gutter of how Hitchcock treats to... women to good things about this movie. Um, uh, I really like the cinematography. I did. Uh, I liked it okay, but I again I feel like I've seen we. It's a really unfortunate thing that you like we don't watch Hitchcock films in chronological order. Yeah, to see that evolve. Right, because this is not as good as the cinematography you see in other films by him. Well, yeah. And so this has this has a lot of proto stuff though. It's it's got the high angles in a lot of things. It's got a uh, it's got some first person sort of stuff. Like like the very opening sequence, I think. Um because we we walk into the music hall, but we just see hands exchanging yeah, and that money was for nice. tickets and feet walking in, and it, it very much sells us as the audience, you know, the theater and the movies being the same thing. I think there's there's a purposeful there's a perfect purposefulness to doing that in trying to equate theater and film um, that that still needed to be done in 1935 because theater was higher than film. Um, and I guess it still kind of is today, but in this sort of, I don't know, distance thing, the people who like theater think theater is higher than film, but the people who like film don't care about theater. So. <laughs> right, right, right. It's them. That. <clears throat> yeah. I really liked, in the scene with the music hall, there's a lot of quick pans between faces um, instead of just cuts. Uh, so someone will ask a question and he'll answer it and then we'll quick pan to the next person asking a question and then quick pan to the next person asking a question uh, instead of just like inserts of those individual right. people um, which seemed really early for that sort of thing to be happening um, yeah I mean I think that probably took some pretty clever work just because of the Balkan problems involved yeah. with the, for the equipment we're u- they're using at the time um, yeah exactly exactly uh, we got... What else do we have? Um, some of the scenes <laughs> on the train are, in, are interesting. Oh, you know what scene I really thought was neat? Some I saw what? a really weird special effect that, like, really caught me off guard. We are in the car when they're driving, okay? And they, those mm-hmm. guys, the dudes, who are kidnapped... Okay, who have kidnapped the lady, Pamela, right? And mm-hmm. um, who I will just refer to as the lady because... Yeah. <laughs> Already, we know nothing because about her anyway. That's as much. That's as much as Hitchcock cares exactly. about. Exactly. That's all I really know about her. Um, yeah. And they're handcuffed, right? Or no, they're not yet handcuffed, but they're in the car, and you see the they're talking in the car, and it appears that the car just dro- like the car is supposed to be moving in the scene. Okay. Mm-hmm. When they're talking, it's pretty clear because we got that whole bounce effect, and then the screens rolling by on the side, right? Yeah. But then it zooms out. And the car keeps driving. It is really yes. wickedly good. Yes. And I was like, yes. how did he do that? That was a great... Because cause our, our view of that is kind of through the window. Right, right. And then and then there, it doesn't seem like there's a cut. There, is, I, there and, has to be a cut. And we but, just pull back as the car drives away. But he away. seems to have gotten it so well lined up that there doesn't even seem like there's a cut. Yeah, what is it? I think it's rope. Where the first like ten minutes of the movie is is one take, and he does, eh, but it only appears to be one take because it's masterful, masterful uh, editing. And yeah, that is that is an early example. That, I mean, that was I, when right I saw there. that. I was like, "Will people get what?" Yeah, because I, it has I rewound to, be a cut. to watch There's that. There's no again. way he had the ability to do that without there being a cut in there. But it is just so yeah. smooth. It blew yeah. my mind when I saw that. I was just like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah, no, that was. Can like you I said, imagine I, the amount I rewound of rewound to watch that again? Visual anal retentiveness that would have been necessary to make <laughs> yes. that work. I know. You know what I mean? That's though, right? why, despite all of his problems, we still think Hitchcock's a masterful det- uh, director because of all of his anal retentiveness to make that stuff like that work. Yeah, because like normal directors, I think probably would have tried it, maybe, or even just like I'm like, "Yeah, that's not no." We can't do that. No, no. Normal directors would have cut from the back. Right, that's From what, the window yeah, shot exactly. to the back of the car. 
They wanted to have, have pan. <laughs> yeah, That's just, appeared it, to have had the cameraman fall off the car and yeah. then get left behind. Yes. It's really weird. Yes. It's a weird shot. I loved it, though. When I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, that's crazy. Because that would be the kind of thing that probably somebody would do with CG now. Oh, yeah. No, that absolutely would be done with CG now. And, like, it's amazing to think, like, any time you see a Hitchcock thing that somebody would have said, no, we'll just CG it now. You're like, but that wasn't even... that. This man yeah. did it without it. You know what I mean? Like, he just... Yeah, that's crazy. That was just that was my favorite shot in the whole film because it just yes. made me like stop moving. Like I'm watching the movie, I'm like, what? And I have to go back and watch and be like, did I really see what I just think I saw? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I. That shot was ridiculous. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, as far yeah. as other things, I mean, like. The movie is okay, but, like, again, like, it's really hard for me to say uh, because, like, I find that thrillers are not my cup of tea anyway. Yeah. And partially because, like, I don't, my mind does not enjoy not, I like, I love books that are thrillers, which is weird, but movies just don't hardly ever do it for me. And, um, you know, I mean, like, I enjoyed it okay, but I found myself not hyper-interested in it. I think I think books are easier because it feels less like you're cheating to turn a few chapters ahead in a book and find out how it's going to play out instead of fast well, But that's the thing the is, I, the I, 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 I've never ever done that in my entire life. I know, even if you don't do it. You even could if you, if you wanted it, to. The, the temptation to do it is more justifiable, I think, when you're reading a book than when you're watching a movie. And I've never done that with a film, but I've certainly done that with a book. Yeah, like, it was just, I don't know, like, it was good, but, like, when, like, taking the fact that I've seen other Hitchcock films that I like more, yeah, I don't like it as much, just mm -hmm. partially because the story's just not that good. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put this in my top five Hitchcock. I may not even put it in my top ten if I, if I sit down and think about that list, um... But it's still, you know... Oh, it's it, good. It, it, it's okay. Be, it'd be close. I have seen a lot worse Hitchcock. <laughs> Anything he made after Birds is terrible. Yeah, well, I mean... Um, it, I don't know, man. Like, it just... It, but the story... I think if, maybe part of it is the source material is a problem. Because its story maybe. does not seem well written. I think, yeah. Uh, Bakken actually congratulated Hitchcock on improving the story. <laughs> and he, he, called the, he called his novel Shockers in that they were they were thrillers um you know they're traditionally what we would call a thriller novel in that um the audience doesn't necessarily <laughs> wouldn't believe that they're true events i think is how he described them even though they're not true events because it's a fiction novel right so the audience <laughs> would be correct yes the audience would be correct in that <laughs> mr tweet yeah, yeah yeah right baron of tweed spear there's a reason why the yes. audience does not think it's correct because it is not <laughs> yes yes um but uh you know maybe it really seems from what i've read about the plot of the novel it it's half formed compared to the this movie and this movie is even half right i know like we're already dealing with a half baked that movie that's like barely <laughs> yeah. a story yeah. Because, like, like, people like, do okay, things in so, the story that I do not understand. Another difference between the movie and the book. Um, so, as the spy is dying, she presents this map. And she had previously, with a town circle, and she had previously said, before I do anything else, there's a man I need to see in Scotland. Um, about a horse. About a horse. No, now it's 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 a plot hole that we don't talk about as to why she wants to go see the man who man kill her. <laughs> turns out to be the principal bad guy, but he puts two and two together. Our our main character and he goes to the town in Scotland and he talks amongst the people to figure out who's the most recent uh, new resident. <laughs> Which is a, just a and weird question. That new by itself, like, house. So. Yeah. Who's the newest He goes guy to that resident's town. house. Goes to that resident's house and it turns out he's the bad guy. Well, in the book, what happens is he's on the run from the police for murder 
and he goes to Scotland to hide out, and he hides out in a house that happens to be owned by the guy he should be running away from. So, in essence, the Hitchcock one is slightly... Still yes, pretty bad. The Hitchcock one at least justifies some of better. the plot holes from the novel, by n- but also doesn't justify its own plot holes. Right. But if we had to compare the two, I would rather yes. have, why on earth did she want to see this man, <laughs> versus, look, I accidentally found the bad guy. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. But the thing is, also at the same time, I can kind of understand why she would want to go. I, I didn't have a huge problem with that. Because if she, yeah, if her she goal is. is to stop the export of this particular piece of information, then the logical person to go shoot yeah, would be... Yeah. We, no, we, the she way, says C, but then again, maybe she just doesn't like yeah. saying, I'm going to go murder a man. Yeah, the way she says it can suggest either way. He takes it as he want, she wants to meet with him, so he's important to my side of right. things. But that's not necessarily a given from... You know, I need to go see this guy before anything else happens. Right, like, I mean, Um, it really could be, I own a gun, I'm going to use that gun to make this man not a man anymore. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. But, I mean, either way, like, I mean, it's not a great setup for the Hitchcock story. It's just better than Mr. (laughs) Tweedsmere's setup. Yes, it's better than what it was. And like I said, in the original, the 39 steps are the steps <laughs> down from the manor house to the escape boat. Why would you name uh, your organization the 39 steps? That's a yeah, stupid I, well, I name. Mean, it's, it's, Blackstone was the name of the organization in the book. Um, Which is a but, better you know, name. Every, I guess, I guess. I think something weird and uh, just is is. I have a question out there. I need to ask, though. Is 39 Steps the name of the book? Yes. So we have our answer why it has to have 39 Steps in it somewhere. Yes. Because we want, we're, it's still at a time when we're, well, even now, today, trying to attract that audience to come that has already yes. read this rather shitty book, which I've never <laughs> read, but I can already tell, and um, wants to see it in action, right? So you have to name the movie 39 Steps, which means 39 Steps has to be somewhere in the movie. But like oh, the could've... the ending I thought it was the gonna... ending I, of the I, novel oh, okay, by the way. Ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. No, please. But the ending of the novel, I just I just before because you're going to complain about this even more, so I need to mention it. <laughs> um so they're they're trying to find the bad guys and they hear a rumor because uh Hene has convinced the police that he's right and he's working with the police. Um they hear from some dock workers that there's at least one German uh crew member on this boat. So they go to this boat, and they walk up the 39 steps, and they see some guys playing tennis. And all the guys playing tennis are speaking perfect English, but Hene recognizes them as the guys he had met earlier, the bad guys. So they arrest them. Okay. That's how it ends. Really? Yes, that's the reveal of what the 39 steps are, and... (laughs) How wait, wait, wait. the bad guys get captured. How, now I need to buy this book, because I need to know, like... <laughs> like, and then, Hene, because he suffers from uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder, counted the yes, steps. Counted One, the steps. two, and then it just counts all the way up through the book. He got to 37, and he saw people playing tennis. He got to 38, and he recognized those people. He got to 39, he said, get them! <laughs> yes. Um, no, like, I just... Yeah, I really want to know how 39 fits into the, the way that's told in, yeah. in the actual writing of the book now. Um, but here's the thing. I This is one thing that caught me off guard. I was not expecting the 39 steps to be, even now, the uh, name of the organization. I would still prefer 39 steps to be the 39 steps that the man memorized in order to make an engine that does not make noise. Yeah. Doesn't that make more sense? That would that would like it's a thirty nine yeah. step process. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know that works. Makes more sense to me than uh, the name. Of I like my spy. I like my spy, spy organizations to have weird names though. I do too. But the five the, rings. But the the thirty nine steps is like the two guys in a truck. Uh, <laughs> you mean a moving company from Columbus? Yes. Uh, no, I mean I'm just. You think they're spies? Yeah, of course they're spies. Well, who are they spying on? People who can't afford proper moving companies? 
doesn't matter. People will buy things from Circuit it's City circa nineteen or two thousand three. <laughs> yeah. We, we have all the records we ever need on all people who purchase stereo equipment from Circuit City from the years 1995 to the years 2004. And we know everything about whenever Circuit City went out of business. I don't remember. Yes. Anyway. Um, but, you know, like, I, yes, I agree. But at the same time, I really, like, especially the end, like, I knew it was going to be the memory guy. And, the, and, the, and, and, and like, and especially when we like show another concert hall, I'm like, of course. Um, but then I really was hoping that like it would be like it would be turn out that he memorized all 39 engineering processes yeah. necessary to do whatever. I assumed it was going to be make a bomb or something. I didn't expect it to be silent yes. engine, which is also I believe impossible. Um, but um, because that would imply there's no friction. Uh, yes. Including on the propeller blades, uh, well, uh, air friction. They, I, I don't know. Uh, Listen, man, there's a lot of problems with it. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I know. But I'm not actually complaining about the movie. It just really caught me off guard when the 39 steps was in the name of the organization. Yes, because I was still kind of waiting for it. You know, that was really what I yeah. was. The only thing that was really left in the movie for me was like, what does 39 steps mean? And it's it's it's. Especially problematic because it seems like Hene knows that when he asks the question. Yeah. Because there's no point in asking the question unless he already knows that the answer is going to vindicate him. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, you can surmise from his situation that, like, obviously 39 Steps is um, important. Although it would have been hilarious in a totally different movie if the guy had been like, I don't know. (laughs) Yes. Well, wait. Does the uh, does Professor whatever the the bad guy does he say what the thirty nine steps are? So. I could have. I don't I could think have so. Zoned but out maybe we're wrong. Bit. Maybe we're uh, maybe we're missing. Yeah, but the I only way know. to find out is to go back and watch the movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, and not not because I don't really. I mean, I could watch it again, but we're in the middle yeah. of recording. <laughs> Never know. It was bad enough that I had to go back and learn exactly what he calls the man with the memory. Yes. Um. That was that was painful. Well, (laughs) no, I mean, like the movies. I mean, like this is not this does not fit into the category of the movies I dislike that we have watched in the Criterion Collection. It's just not doesn't fit into the category of the movies that I'm going to watch again. Exactly. You know, it's 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 now just a piece of data that I have more data on Hitchcock, which is which one of the one of the fifty things I've learned. Yeah, right. Like it's I now know first of all that I even more know how all Hitchcock thrillers will unfold. Um, yes, and then I also know that and he know that, that he's been reusing that uh, reusing that formula for a while. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, anyway. This is not new. That he did not uh, cook this one up in 1938 or whatever. He cooked it up even earlier. And All seems right. like, yeah, no, it's just yeah, it's it's not bad, but it's not my favorite either. So exactly. Well, unless there's no, anything else you have to say, I think that yeah, that, that pulls us to the end of. The 39 Steps. Thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. Next week we'll be talking about uh, Charade, which has been called the best Hitchcock movie that Hitchcock never made. And I would totally agree with that. Stanley Donnan's 1963 Charade came out the same year as The Birds, which is the last good Hitchcock movie. Um, <laughs> Marmy's terrible. Uh, what's it? There's, there's one about. There's one he made in. Oh, I think it was 72 about a. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything about a after Strangler. Birds, so. It's about yeah, it's about a strangler in London, and it's he made it in London, and it's oh, it's so terrible. It's, it's absolutely the worst Hitchcock movie I've ever seen. Um, anyway, thank you for listening. We'll see yeah, you next. See time. you next time.
You've been listening to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriteria at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.